J.T. Crowley is talking books. On the show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. They'll give you their take on the writing process and how to create the secret sauce of page-turning deliciousness. Let's get into that magical mixture of the art and science of creativity. Here's J.T. Crowley, author of The Smart Kids and your podcast host. Hello. I'm J.T. Crowley, and today I have a fascinating author from Vancouver Island in Canada, Donelda Benson, the author of the Kindred Chronicles series. Donelda describes her books as time travel romance novels. Like her software engineer, Danish husband, Paul, Donelda has long held a passion for writing. Her first trilogy, Timeless Trilogy, was published in 2020. Book one was Young in the Age of Champions and was swiftly followed by books two and three, Younger in the Age of COVID and Youngest in the Dreams, in that order. But for the purpose of this podcast, we're going to concentrate on her latest trilogy, Kindred Chronicles. The first book in this new series of hers is called Kindred Spirits, and the second, everybody, is Kindred Sisters. Donelda is currently working on the third book, Kindred Web, which is scheduled for release in January 2023, and I dearly hope that she gives me the wonderful opportunity, everybody, to interview her about that book. We'll see. <laughs> Donelda holds a master's degree in administration. She's, you know, she's very far. She was a teacher, a coacher. And that's, so teaching and coaching was at the heart of her life. And that has been for a very long time. And she believes to be a successful person, you have to lead by example. And that is exactly what Donelda has done throughout her whole life. She's competed at the National Olympic team level for Canada. She's won numerous awards and her athletic career spans six decades. And most of that has been around basketball. As a child, she grew up in a subsistence farm, considers herself fortunate. She married young, taught maths, won athletic awards She works tirelessly at any project she undertakes. She sees herself as funny, sarcastic, sensitive, and creative. For her romance scenes, wait for this, everybody, she relies on her own sexy, fun-loving self. Hmm. She loves puzzles, is okay at dancing, hates learning new languages, failed as a pianist, but she loves writing, she loves creme brulee, but has no time for negative people in her life or bocce ball. So you can see this author I've got for you today, everybody, is a, has had a very busy life, a very successful life. So let's invite her onto the show to talk to her and discover more about her trilogy series, Kindred Chronicles. Donelda, come and join me. Well, John, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you've certainly led a busy life, haven't you? Uh, Yeah, I've kept busy. Yeah, you have. (laughs) Donelda, Let's open up the first book of this amazing uh, series, Kindred Chronicles series of yours, Kindred Spirits. And I want to head straight to the first three chapters, which are headed up as follows, everybody. Kirsten's Crossing in May 1862. Angela's Adolescence, Des Moines, Iowa, 1967. And Kirsten, this is the place, Salt Lake City, 1862. When I look at this section of the book, Donelda, for me, these chapters are you brilliantly setting the scene from Denmark 
to Salt Lake City in the 1860s, to Des Moines in Iowa in the 1960s. An epic journey, as well as introducing us to Kirsten and Angela, two formidable women in their own right, you also introduce us to the imaginary character Flo. So my question to you, Donelda, is this. How did you come up with this concept of genealogical timelines and the characteristics and the storylines you gave Kirsten and Angela? How did you do it? Well, I, um, I have a Danish husband. I've loved genealogy. I've traced my own family back nine generations on my maternal line. And um, when I do that, I feel a special closeness to the women that have come before me, the pioneers, the, um, the strength just radiates through. And I thought, <clears throat> wouldn't it be amazing if they could actually come and be with me? So that's the, that's the idea that women, that families are forever and that the women are the strength, the bond that holds it all together. So Kirsten, a young teenager, um, I thought it would be dramatic to start out with the, um, the Danish Mormon pioneers coming across the fervent converts that they were, and that um, Kirsten was uh, brought along with her family to be a, an obedient young Mormon girl. And uh, then paralleling that, as she comes across, then we have the young girl in modern times, well, almost modern times, um, Angela, and she's growing up um, wondering why she doesn't fit in her family. She doesn't seem to have anything in common with her parents, or she's, she's really struggling with, with the answers of what her parents are keeping from her. So we've got a parallel situation of two young women um, coming into their own right, uh, developing from being obedient and um, sort of downplayed to recognizing their talents, their strengths, overcoming their flaws, and uh, joining together a little later in the book, as um, the reader will find. So where does the imaginary character Flo come in? Oh, she's... Flo. That, I love Flo. Um, my sister had an imaginary friend, and, and uh, this led me to, to develop Flo as um, the companion for this young child who was growing up uh, in a very lonely situation with parents that she couldn't, uh, didn't feel close affection to. Um, so Florence is different than most imaginary friends because Florence could interact. The only problem was the other family members couldn't see her and Otherwise, she was she was real, and she she stayed with Angela until Angela got into high school into grade eight. So she she was very important to Angela's development. Angela wanted so much to be like Flo, outgoing and funny and and afraid of nothing. And Angela was felt she was a misfit. Uh, not not a popular girl at school and shy. Um, she stuttered. Uh, she had a lot of things to overcome. Because I mean, a lot of kids have imaginary friends, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, when I look, Donelda, at the book, you know, it's like the whole of this book. I've been fascinated with your various relationships of Kirsten's. Now, Kirsten, everybody, does have some relations here. Her relationship with her parents, Beth, Daniel, Angela, Paul, 
All these relationships are unique in their own way. Yet you cleverly knit them together throughout the genealogical timeline. These relationships are at the very core of this book, aren't they? And would you care to lift the lid off the can here and give us an insight to your thinking here? This is all about these women's relationships. Well, to start with Kirsten's relationships, she starts out as an obedient little girl. She becomes a very strong-willed woman. But in the meantime, she is pressured to marry um, um, a man, a wealthy man in Salt Lake. And her relationship with him, she's miserable. She's the third wife. Um, but it's interesting because her wedding ring is actually what draws her into modern times because it gets passed down through the generations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and it, Angela is wearing her wedding ring, having found it in the family treasures. And she wears it around her neck as a, as a, a security for her. And this is the feature that actually activates the gift that they both hold. And it's very important. I, I start the book with Kirsten. And she is extremely important in book number one. Because it's her love story that is followed through. Um, I don't want to give away all the stories, but she's a beautiful young woman and she meets this amazing young man. <clears throat> and um, their love is so great that it almost tears the entire family apart. Because if she stays in the future with her new love, mm -hmm. she can't, uh, her whole generations destroy her. So let's give this a clear picture here to the listeners. The relationship with her parents and with Daniel is in the 1860s. That's the timeline. Mm -hmm. Her relationship with Angela, Beth and Paul is in the 1960s, a hundred years right. apart, isn't that's it? Right. That's right. That's, that's what the gift does. It draws people together that are in the same maternal line. And because Kirsten was so unhappy, wishing for a better life, she got drawn into, into modern times. And of course, this gift of, of traveling through time is from the women in the family. It's on the well, women's side. Mm -hmm. None of the men can see these people if they come as, as no, uh, spirits. Oh. Yeah. Donalda, let's head to chapters 17 and 18. And I love these chapters, I have to say. And that's why I've put them in here. And, you know, it's, it's Get Me Home and Life Without Kirsten. They are the titles, everybody, of these two chapters. Now, Angela, who spends most of her lunch times researching her genealogical timeline via the Latter-day Saints meticulous <laughs> records you know, of times and dates, realizes that the family timeline on the female side, everybody, is at risk. And that something has to be done about this. Would you care to embellish, to open up without giving too much of the plot away here? You know, give us a little sneak preview as to the relevance of these two chapters in this series. Well, we have several rescues. But I think what you're alluding to is the relationship the way that Kirsten manages to save the timeline as well as be with her love. Is this what you're referring to? Yes, she's got, she's got 
In her in the timeline, Kirsten's got a husband in the 1860s. She's got yeah. a lover in the 1960s. Yeah. And yeah. Angela realizes a there's a problem here that yeah. if Kirsten doesn't return to back in time, the timeline is going to fall apart. Exactly. It exist. Exactly. What's she going to do? What's she going to do? Well, she has to go back and have her baby, Sarah. That's a no-brainer. But what happens to her when she goes back is pretty exciting, pretty um, unusual. And how she manages to actually do both things, to save the family as well, it's important that she comes back to modern times. She's very instrumental in, uh, <clears throat> in helping Angela with finding out who she is and, and rescuing her natural parents that have, um, you know, have been following her life throughout. But, you know, it's, um, I don't want to give it all away you know there's there's murders there's suicides there's uh prejudice there's all sorts uh, there's people being burned as witches um there's a lot of people that are in trouble in angela's family and uh she and with the help of kirsten eventually uh, form a team and become the saviors of their family basically I do, and I want to um, come to that because in the book, um, there's a part of the book, a very significant part, which is the rescue of, you know, of Angela's actual parents. Mm -hmm. This is a very significant part of the story. Why did you give so much weighting in the book to this storyline, her parents, her biological parents? I don't well, it's, to wait. It's <laughs> it's what it's what started Angela searching in the first place without her desire to get the answers the truths that were being hidden from her she wouldn't have done the genealogical research she wouldn't have been able to um, use the gift the way she did so it was um, it was important but Angela has a problem with time traveling. She really does. She, she gets terribly sick. And uh, when she goes back to try and save her father and her mother, it ends up causing more problems than, um, you know, I, <clears throat> early in the book, people will discover that Angela is biracial. Her father is um, half African American, and in the times that uh, they were living, Angela's white mother Lena and the father James, they um, were ha under a lot of persecution, being a mixed race couple, and uh, it was not a safe place to raise a baby. That's why Angela had been left with where she was. And, uh, yeah, so... In the states of the deep South America. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were in Louisiana, is where her mother, who was gifted, got drawn um, and discovered her, her love in Louisiana. So, um, yeah. It's a it, fascinating story. And, of course, it, was, it continues in the second book, doesn't it? Well, it does. It does. So um, let's turn to the second book. <clears throat> okay. Kindred Sisters. Kindred Sisters, everybody. Now, let's move, to, as I said, to the second book, Kindred Sisters. And again, like in the first book, I want to go to the first three chapters. And they're headed up, catching up, Pox Quest presented, Pox Arrives. Here you have, you know, when we, when we look at the scene, you've got nearly everyone under the same roof. They're all in Angela's house. You've got Paul and Kirsten. 
Lena and James, Beth Rupert, and Marta. Now, Marta is a very, very important character in the series, everybody. And it's the first time I mentioned this in the podcast. But when you look at Donelda's book, the prologue is about Marta. And I'm saying no more. So here we all have everybody living in the house, all happy relationships. And then you, Donelda Benson, go and muddy the waters by bringing in pox. A well, it's lover. interesting. So it's why interesting. did you do this? What's the storyline here? What are you doing here? <laughs> well, Beth used to be sort of a promiscuous young woman um, who was uh, disillusioned by men, let's say. And she was very attracted to Marta. And I guess she's bisexual. Um, she had, and she loved Marta or, and was having difficulty because Marta still was enthralled by someone she had left in the past someone called Pox. Mm. Now, Pox is a mischievous, always getting into trouble, um, good addition to the, to the cast. Um, so that was really hard on Beth to, to not have her love um, answered. So Marta wanted, um, was still longing for Pox. And Pox was searching through the ages to find um, to find Marta. Now, the reader is just saying, oh, they must be of the same maternal line to have this gift. And that's true. We can tie the two together. You There's can. three. Yeah. But because these women, when they when they have passed away can travel to their other maternal beings, their afterlife is a little different than the average dead body. So we have, um, we have a number of people like Pox that come into the series. Because let's get this right here. The um, when they travel, time travel, there are two forms. There's a spiritual form and there's the physical form. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, the, the characters have to go and rescue the physical form. I'm right. Exactly. I'm right. Exactly. And um, that's what happened to Pox because um, Pox had been burned as a witch even earlier than Marta. Now, to go back into the 1600s um, requires quite a bit of uh, research on their part, on my part, um, to uh, execute the rescue. And they become quite adept at, at doing this. So Angela never does, in this book, overcome the, um, that problem of being sick. So she's... She's the leader, but she's not at her best all the times. And of course, the, um, the men folk who can't see, um, um, say, if one of the women has been transported through time and it's only been spiritually transported, they can't be seen. Only the women can see them. So in the house, you know, the men are seeing, you know, pots and pans moving around, which is pots, because they can't see it, but the women can. That is unique, isn't it? Yeah, our men, our men are a special bunch because they're very tolerant and supportive of the entire. Um, they realize the the importance of their saving lives here. They're changing lives, and so um, Angela's has, um, love interest, whom she never does get. You know, I'm coming just, to that. They, they just, oh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, but Aaron still is very supportive. And uh, he's the he's the 
the magnet that draws her back to, to modern times if she does travel. Now, I want to talk about Erin because the, the character Erin in the first book, Angela's, you know, um, which we see in the second book, turns out to be, you know, the, the love relationship um, develops. But in the first book, um, Angela, who's working at the, um, you know, the, the register newspaper. at the um, publisher's, the newspaper there, um, Aaron comes in and she just sees him as an arrogant servant, so and there's no relationship, or if it's just totally icy. But in the second book, you really do develop that character with Aaron, and that ice melts, doesn't it? And this is a very, very important relationship, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, um, uh, yeah, he's he's a hunk, he's he's um, big red haired hockey player that used to play for the NFL and uh, or NHL and um, was injured. So he became a sports reporter. Um, he's very supportive of Angela and he was uh, attracted to her right from the get go. But he's particular about his women too. Uh, he was a returned missionary. Uh, once again, the Mormon touch comes in and um, he um, he loves Angela throughout, but in book number two, um, things happen that even though their love is developing to the point where you think you've got your happy ending, tragedy comes along and puts you back to square one and uh, they have to start all over again. So you never know what's going to happen in, never know. Uh, in relationships when, no. when you've got that time travel romance. <laughs> now, Donelda, can we go to chapter 10, Secrets Revealed? And here's is where Angela drops a bombshell, doesn't she? Here, as far as I can see, something from her past, which is important to the future genealogical female timeline. <laughs> and for me, this chapter highlights a common denominator factor running throughout the whole of both of these books. That is that a lot of these women in your books have, for some reason, had to give away their children. What and why have these traveling women had to do endure and give up? Would you care to, again, lift the lid up here partially and let us into the storyline here a little bit? Because... Well, Each one of these women has had to do something. Why? I think by do? now, I think by now, you know that Angela was kind of reclusive and, and uh, shy. But in her grade 12 years, she and Beth tried to put themselves out there a little bit. And, and Angela got invited to a party. And at the party, she didn't know, but she was brought there for the guys. And um, she was had an unfortunate situation, and which left her expecting twin daughters, and she had to give up the twin daughters because of a really terrible betrayal in book two. There was a good result, and she becomes reunited. But there's this common thread that John alluded to, which was the women having to give up their daughters. And every one of the women, for some reason, has had to part with their daughters. Now, when I was making this story, I could think of no other pain worse Mm. <laughs> Sorry, but losing your daughters. So sure. that's what uh, that's what we worked in there. And you know, it's important to know when an author speaks about the characters, they put a lot of emotion behind it, and you've just demonstrated that you put you know emotion about the women that you're talking about in your books is so strong. Um, I want to go on to. 
Now, you've put in this second book a huge upset coming down the line. Don't say who or what is about it, but you really do blow the story apart here for me. Um, and I just wanted to know, um, you know, when we're in Chapter 17, the huge knock on a faint that you've created with this unsurprising twist. And, you know, again, the, uh, the future is coming here down the line with Angela's twins. Mm-hmm. Do you give those twins the gift? Oh, what is yeah, the they, yeah, they, um, they discover they have the gift too. And in book three, they're very instrumental in actually doing what Angela can't do. So, um, you know, I think you'll fall in love with them. Um, they're just beautiful, um, beautiful young women with skills and uh, talents of their own. So I hope you enjoy the Talis and, and Tara. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed the whole two, two books. And I certainly can't wait until, you know, for Kindred Web. So, you know, what I would like to know, Donelda, is, I mean, these books are fascinating, everybody. You know, the time travel, how, you know, Donelda has the inept ability to take characters from the 1860s through to the 1960s, you know, love relationships back in the 1860s to love relationships in the 1960s, both in spirit and physical formats. And all these women who can have this gift of time traveling. And I have to make it very clear, everybody, that they also have the gift of manipulating time. Don't they, Donelda? Well, what do you mean by manipulating time? They can manipulate the time, can't they, by arriving in certain... Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Arriving just at the right time to go back and change what has happened. Well, they, they try and do as little changing as they can. They try and merely rescue, take, take someone out of a, a perilous situation and um, give them another chance. But they, they don't go back to try and make changes that are going to, oh, save the president from getting shot or or something they you know i think uh, stephen king already did that um oh yeah so, uh, so donelda what's next for donelda benson you know, both in your own life and your books i know and i know kindred web is coming out can you give us a brief insights to what's going to come in that book what are your plans for the future okay Okay. Um, well, Flo comes back uh, in all her color, and um, she has an interesting, uh, unlikely companion when she comes back. And uh, it's her love relationship that's featured in book three. Um, by that time, you know, um, Angela's relationship is. Uh, Happily ever after, Kirsten's relationship is happily, I believe in happy endings. So the happy ending of um, Kindred Web is going to be a little different than the standard happy ending. I'll just say that. Okay. Who do you, Danelda, see as your market for your books? And furthermore, who would you like to see reading your books? Oh, I'd like to see everybody reading my books, of course. But um, I don't know. I think it's a good binge series um, or it's a, a fast-paced weekend book if you're going on a trip. Um, I'm doing some uh, some presentations at some seniors' um, homes, and uh, I find that they really enjoy the stories because they're... Uh, it kind of dissolves the end of life. If you if you think about this, um, it, it goes along with the entire 
attitude that science now is um, extending life and aging is treatable. So if you look at time as just a river that flows, that uh, sometimes it goes fast, sometimes it goes slow, and time fascinates me. So I think that anybody who's fascinated by time, genealogy, perhaps Mormon background, uh, perhaps uh, just mothers and daughters, I think there's a, a broad audience and uh, I hope that they'll go to denelda.com and and uh, check it, check me out. And a little romance thrown in as well, everybody. You bet. Absolutely. I've read the books. <laughs> where, <laughs> where can people get your books from, Denelda? Oh, they're, they're available on Amazon. You can go to Goodreads or BookBub, but Amazon.com. And uh, if you're wondering, I'm the only Denelda around. So if you go to denelda.com, you go to my website and you can pick up a free uh, prequel to this uh, series called Scorched, which is, um, it's about Marta actually. And uh, the, whole, the whole little book is about Marta's uh, adventure from, She's a delightful character, I think. She is. Back in the 1860s mm, in Denmark, everyone. And she was, she was based on an actual burning. And uh, it was burning. one of the last in Denmark. But uh, the dates, the, uh, the name was changed to present the, to, to protect the innocent. And uh, the innocent was saved. <laughs> there you go. Danelda Benson, thank you so much for coming on the show and giving us a brief insight into your wonderful world of writing. Danelda Benson, everybody. Thank I'm you. JT Crowley. So, as I say at the end of all my podcasts, thanks for listening, watching, wherever you are in the world. So, until next time, stay safe. Mm-hmm.